So as we dive into the series, The Church is Made for More, we started with the understanding that the church needs to get out of the mindset that doing more always equals more ministry. And instead, as we consider what we do in ministry, we should fully embrace our purpose, that the church exists to unite all things to Jesus. Some of you stopped me last week in the lobby or in Bible study, and you mentioned how inspired and encouraged you felt by last week's worship, and I would have to agree with you. I feel the same way, especially after I make it through the first section of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I mean, who can't feel the love of God when we read and hear passages like, He chose us from the foundations of the world, or that we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. These are words of pure gospel, good news to each and every one of us that that in Jesus Christ, God has loved us from even before our existence and has always had a plan, always had a purpose for us in his redemptive mercy and grace. So church, I, I think we should be overwhelmingly excited by such a reality. Go ahead and grab your Bibles and flip with me to the book of Ephesians. As we continue our sermon series, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. But as we get ready to dive in, I, I think it's important that we note that too often we naturally put up a barrier in place and it hinders our own exponential impact and the, the exponential impact of Christ working it through, of us, through us. Some of us try to call this barrier humility. Some of us call it the reality and the truth of life. Some of us just call it cynicism or relativism or reality checks. Right? We all have that time where we focus on, well, I don't think I can actually do this. If left to our own devices, it's true. We do fail. As Paul says in his letter to the Romans, we all fall short of the glory of God. So in that reality, and in trying to understand that reality in our lives, we naturally put up a barrier to living our lives of purpose. And as we put up that barrier, I can't do it, we fall short of the glory of God. And we hinder the exponential impact that Christ can have through us into the world around us. We get stuck in the past. We get stuck in the past. And I'm not talking about the good old days mindset that almost everybody has. You know, you know the one that I mean, right? It usually ends with the phrase something to the effect of, back in my day when I had to walk uphill both ways in the snow to school, that's how we did it. Kids these days are weak. Well, I got to be honest with you, I know that's not true for most of you because you grew up in Texas, okay? <laughs> and for those that grew up in the north, I know there is not snow where you grew up 365 days of the year, all right? It may have been in May, but not 365 days of the year, all right? We fall into that mindset, and we fall into that mindset as a church, and it does hinder our exponential impact in the world around us because the 21st century is not exactly the same as the 20th century, nor is 2022 the same as 1985, okay? Thank goodness we have things like Netflix now to entertain, our, to entertain us. And while some things never change, other things do, so getting in the good old days mindset doesn't help us. But that's not the past that I'm talking about. I'm referring to the past of, of who we were before we were disciples of Jesus. And maybe you're like me and you were baptized as a baby or a young child and so you've only known what it means to be in the church. However, like me, I think you could probably also imagine a time where you lived less like of a disciple of Jesus than you do today. That's the past that we often get stuck in. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writes this. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Okay, did you notice how Paul describes the reality of the disciples of Jesus in Ephesus? He uses the past tense. 
you were dead in trespasses and sins, or among whom when once we all once lived. We were by nature children of wrath. If we know anything about Paul's use of the Greek language in his letters to the various churches of the New Testament, we know that Paul was precise in the languages that he uses. He used the language in such a way to make it abundantly clear the point that he was trying to make. And so as he continues to encourage the Ephesian church and us as modern-day disciples, he uses the past tense, the aorist tense, to describe their condition as dead in their sins or as children of wrath. He uses the past tense to describe something that is no longer true of them, no longer true of us as disciples of Jesus either. Yet that's the past that we continue to try to live in, isn't it? The last sermon series we did here at Peace through the month of August addresses many of the giants that we have to face in our life because of our sinfulness, because of our struggles and shame, and almost all of them come from some brokenness in our past that we still continue to try to wrestle with in the present. This is true of all of us, though. You and I, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we did once walk in the darkness. We have been children of wrath by our sinful nature. But in the grace and the mercy of God, this is no longer true of us as disciples of Jesus. That's the lie that Satan, our enemy, tries to, to tell us to dramatically impact how we live out our purpose as disciples of Jesus, redeemed in his death and resurrection. I'm not saying we don't sin, because we do. I do, you do, we all do it. But in Christ Jesus, as his disciples, redeemed in his death and resurrection, that is no longer our identity. Our sinfulness, our brokenness, our shame is no longer our identity. That's no longer who we are. So look how Paul continues. Verse 4, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So Paul reminds them of what has been true of their past, and then he reminds them of who they now are as disciples of Jesus. Paul reminds you and me who we now are as disciples of Jesus. And the language that Paul uses here is something that continues to be, something that remains to be true. Right? So it's something like God being rich in mercy. An ongoing act, an ongoing trait of God is that he's rich in mercy. He made us, or better translation is making us alive together with Christ. Or seated, or the better translation is actually is seating us with him in the heavenly places. See, we often get confused in the English translation because culturally and I think literally we struggle with present realities. What Paul is trying to show us as an ongoing present reality, we, we often translate as something that has taken place. It's a past thing for us. And as we translate it this way, literally in our word choices, we also translate it that way in our hearts. As in, I once was made alive with Christ. Uh, God was once rich in his mercy to me. Or that we were once seated and counted among the saints standing around the throne of Christ, as if that is no longer true of us. But it is. Because it is an ongoing present reality in our lives as disciples of Jesus, 
redeemed in his death and resurrection. We, we are redeemed. We are made alive together in Christ. We are counted among those who will stand around the throne of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Paul wraps up this encouragement. Verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship. Some translations say masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's especially that reality in verse 10 that I want us to pay attention to, that we are God's masterpiece. This is our present reality. This is not something that was true of us. This is not something that will be true of us. This is true today. This is our present reality, that we are God's masterpiece. And I know that that most of the time our brains immediately think of those famous works of art that stand in museums for for generations to see, But, but given that some English translations use workmanship, I do think there's an opportunity for us to take a slightly different look at, look at how we as the church are made for more in this. What if being God's masterpiece, or what if being God's workmanship means you are perfectly redeemed and grown in his love to execute his exact purpose in your life? By the way, that, that is actually what it means. See, Paul is continuing this idea that the church exists to unite all things to Jesus, and that you and I, now as the church, are the ones who will live out this purpose in our daily lives. So, that, so this means, as God's redeemed, as God has redeemed us in Christ Jesus and brought us out of death and into life, out of the darkness and into his light, He has also perfectly gifted us and perfectly shaped us to live out His purpose in our lives. Satan tries to tell us otherwise. He likes to tell those lies that get us to dwell in the past. And if we're honest with ourselves, he doesn't have to work very hard to do so. Because we like to keep ourselves in the past too. We dwell on our sinfulness, we dwell on our failures and our mistakes and our shortcomings, and we limit how much we think our Savior Jesus Christ can actually do through us. Brothers and sisters, the confession and absolution and worship is not for you to dwell on your past and your sinfulness. It is so you are set free in the words of absolution that your sins are forgiven. You are a redeemed child of God. Don't dwell on the sins you've just confessed. They are forgiven. They are no more. You are set free. The very cornerstone of our faith is that Jesus was raised from the dead. Actual physical death. And in his resurrection, he conquered sin, death, and the devil. So just follow with me. If that is true as we believe and confess that it is. Don't you think that Jesus, who was raised from the dead, can overcome our shortcomings and failings too? We are exactly who God wants to use to unite all things to himself in the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. That is why you and I are here. That is why he is working in our lives. That that is why we are his disciples. Because we exist to unite all things to Jesus. You are exactly who God wants to be in the lives of the people that he's placed around you to be about sharing the good news of life and hope in Jesus. Shockingly, I am in the exact person that God wants to be in the lives of those that he's placed around me. Be that my spouse, my children, my co-workers, the the people at karate school, the random person I meet in the grocery store. And what is true of me is also true of you. And in embracing that reality in our Savior, 
that the church is made for more and that, and that the church actually has more impact on the world around us and embracing the reality that we are exactly who God wants to use to spread his good news. And we actually find out that the church is made for more. Because we bring the same truth into the lives of those who are hurting and struggling, those, those who, are, who are wrestling with shame and guilt and, and who need to be reminded they too no longer have to dwell in the past, there is freedom and our hope and hope in our Savior Jesus Christ. When we live out that purpose and we bring that good news, then we have exponential impact in the world around us. So let's try to live that reality out this week. Let's try to live in the present reality instead of the forgiven and redeemed past. And here's a couple of ways I think we can do it. One, I think we need to give ourselves daily reminders of reality. What is going to remind you of the reality of who you now are in Jesus Christ? Is it a post-it note on your mirror? Is it a daily reminder on your phone? My understanding is that most of us need at least three positive reminders for every negative reminder in our life. So it's pretty easy to understand why we so often fall into the, uh, the past and forget who we now are in Christ Jesus. But how can you remind yourself that what is true of you now as a disciple of Jesus is that you are God's workmanship? You are exactly who he needs to share the good news with those that are in your life. Try a variety of things this week. If you're married, include your spouse in the conversation. If you have children, include them in the conversation. A trusted friend, somebody that can be that reminder to you of the present reality in Jesus. You know, I didn't do it last week. I didn't introduce myself this week. But maybe I will this week. Maybe I'll introduce myself as a reminder to me. Hey, I'm Brian, a disciple of Jesus. And then secondly, I think we need to be good news to others. As God's workmanship, the exact person he needs in the lives of those that he's placed around us, I think we need to intentionally live this way. And this is what I mean when I say that we move the mission forward through, through gospel planting. It's being a source of hope for those who struggle to see it. It's being a, a source of joy for those who are stuck and the pain of brokenness and sin, or, or reconciliation for those who continue to hold on to the anger because it's easier to be mad than it is to forgive. But see, when we live out our present reality as God's workmanship, we become good news to those around us because we are showing them the redeeming love of Jesus. So how can you actually be good news to other people this week? Don't be the stick in the mud. Don't be grumpy because you've lived long enough to earn that right. Be good news. Be the source of hope and joy in the lives of those that God has placed around you. Because it might be as simple as a smile at the sales clerk who's seen any number of grumpy customers that day. It might be being the friend who's simply willing to sit in the pain with them when everyone else around them tries to solve the pain. It might just be helping your spouse with a chore that you hate doing around the house. Being a good news presence, what we call gospel planting, is about bringing hope and love and joy and peace and reconciliation when it simply cannot be found anywhere else but in Jesus. The church is made for more Jesus. And the church is made for more masterpieces. And we are those masterpieces. We are the ones that are set free in the grace of God to be the good news presence in the lives of those he has placed around us. As Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we, that you and I, the church, should walk in them. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.